It's Off Air with Julie Stewart-Binks on the Bet Rivers Network. Hey guys, I'm Julie Stewart-Binks for Bet Rivers and welcome to Off Air, the show that likes to talk about everything that happens when the red light is off. You know, conversations and commercial breaks or after we're done recording, the good stuff. I mean, we're technically on air until we're not, but this show is a conversation that is loose, fun, sometimes off topic, and shows more about who someone is rather than always about what they do. Today's guest is someone I met virtually in 2020 and then in real life at the Tokyo 2020 Olympics, which was in 2021, as you remember. She's an MLB analyst for ESPN and Spectrum TV covering the LA Dodgers and is also a two-time Olympic softball medalist, Jessica Mendoza. It is great to catch up with you again on what is the third different show, I believe, that I've been hosting. How have you been? Absolutely awesome. It's been a good summer. We got full swing. I To me, summertime is the best. I mean, not only like baseball and softball, but my kids aren't in school. They get to travel with me. It's been awesome. Oh, that's fine. That's nice. A a bit of a different change to have your kids with you. I'm sure that like, what's that like as a mom calling a game and also having kids like running around the booth? (laughs) It's awesome. I I just did a Dodger game last week and my nine-year-old sat on my lap and I was a little nervous about it. And (laughs) <laughs> He's actually done it before. Both my kids have done it. Um, so it's not something new. I like to have them around me when I'm working. And as long as they understand, like, okay, buddy, you cannot talk until, like, the inning is over. Like, they've got it timed out, like, perfectly now. Um, but just to be able to, like, snuggle up with him and call a game um, is kind of my heaven, to be honest. Like, sitting in Vin Scully's booth calling a Dodger game, and I've got my nine-year-old just soaking in the game. He had his own headset on so he could listen to, and it was pretty cool. I wanted to show you, um, okay, you're going to love this, by the way. I've been very excited, but I found a, I don't know if you can see this. It is a softball Barbie, (gasps) Tokyo 2020. Where did you get that? Softball Barbie. I found it at like a corner store in Manhattan, just like a random balloon and card store. And obviously (laughs) I actually like feel like, Jess, well, actually the woman on the back, like, cause she's holding gold medal and you have a gold. I think this might be you. We'll pretend it and, is. um, I think like you need to have this, uh, I I'm going to send this to you <gasps> because I obviously, yes. like I didn't play softball, but I got to see what it was like at the Olympics. Yeah, like you were seeing, right down on the field. I was, yes. Yeah, so Jess and I were beside one another. Uh, she was with NBC. I was with OBS. A little bit different <laughs> in terms of our jobs at that point. At that point, and uh, obviously, I mean, you have won two two medals, um, and it was so cool to kind of like be there and and see it all and really wow. take it all in, and then get all the emotions from all the athletes, which were for me like a lot. I felt it was like very overwhelming. I don't know about you. What was it like for you after, or like being there, no one was there and kind of like getting all the emotions from the athletes? Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of emotion for me just because the last time softball was in the Olympic games, remember it had taken a 16 year hiatus. And so, um, because softball and baseball were eliminated from the Olympic games. So Tokyo was the first time since I had played in Beijing softball had returned and um i'd planned so many games on that field um throughout japan my whole career and so being down on the field interviewing you know cat osterman monica abbott my own teammates that i had played with and then after they lost i think that was the hardest thing is it was hard for me to contain my own emotions because it was like a replay of beijing and us losing to japan and um just how hard that was and you know they're your sisters you go through an olympic games and you live together for a year i mean they're your your family and i just felt that so it was a very deep connection i cover a lot of sports as do you this was something that was on a whole other level of emotion connection but also surrealness as you mentioned because there was no one in the stands going into softball a little bit more i mean First of all, it's a great sport and and I and I love watching it and I love seeing women excel at it. But when you were younger growing mm-hmm. up, were you ever 
like, did you ever want to play baseball? Did you think when you were a kid, like, hey, no, I want to be a, I want to be a baseball player. What the men do? Yeah, I actually was. I was a baseball player when I first started playing. That was the sport I played. I was the only girl on the team, and we would go to Dodger games. I grew up outside of Los Angeles, and um, my mom's company that she worked for would get season tickets, and every like a couple a couple weekends a year, you know, weekdays during the year, we'd get to go and use those tickets, which was so cool. And it was during the 80s and Fernando Mania and being a Hispanic, you know, girl and coming from a family that's from Mexico, knowing Fernando Mania and what that did. Um, I was obsessed with I want to play on this team. And I remember being young and picturing myself on the field as a Dodger. And it wasn't until I got older that I remember someone telling me, like, do you see a girl out there? Like, girls don't play baseball. And I was playing baseball, but... A note, it was like that wake up moment where, you know, the purity of a kid, you just see athletes, right? I'm like, I'm an athlete, they're an athlete. I wasn't seeing gender and I could see myself out there. But when that huge moment of someone, they weren't even doing it mean, they were just like, do you see any girls out there? And do you see any women? And I mean, not even, I mean, now at least we have female coaches in front office, but there was not a female like anywhere, announcer booth, nowhere. And that hit me hard. And it crushed a dream for sure, because I literally would put on my Dodger uniform and picture myself as Brett Butler up to the plate, getting a base hit up the middle, stealing second. You know, I had all these visions and goals. Um, And it wasn't until the 96 Olympics when I first saw softball in the Olympic Games for the very first time and Dot Richardson and Lisa Fernandez that I grew a joy and happiness and motivation that there was another level for women to play, even if it wasn't Major League Baseball. Wow, that's got to have been such a disappointing feeling when you realize that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was it was hard. And it's something that I take pride in now when I see young girls at the field. And even though we don't have a major league baseball player that's a woman, we have women everywhere and it's growing And that makes me so happy for girls to see the opportunity that we have in men's sports, women's sports, all of it, that there aren't these areas where you feel like it is just an absolute concrete wall that you can't break down, that there is opportunity. And I think eventually we're going to see women, you know, more women that are playing baseball get more opportunities in college and continue to move forward. But the point is, is just for young girls to not have their dreams crushed, to be able to see themselves and the athletes that are in front of them. Do you ever see like a reality where, you know, there would be a professional women's baseball league or women would be in baseball? Like, it's just interesting hearing you grow up and getting that realization that like, oh, shoot, like I can't play baseball because of my the way I was born. Like, well, great. It starts at the youth level and we're seeing that, you know, obviously I cover the little league world series and little league baseball and softball, but seeing, you know, players like Monet Davis just rock the world and playing baseball at a young age and dominate, um, got so many young girls to say, I want to play baseball. And so you're seeing more youth opportunities and really the opportunities were always there. It was just, I think communities being open to girls playing baseball, not being like, oh, sweetie, honey, you go over there. Like, you don't play with the boys. Um, But actually being like, heck yeah, like I got this. A lot of moms that were athletes that are like, girl, I got you. A lot of dads that are like, I want my daughter to have these same opportunities. It's definitely changed. It starts at like the youth level. Now where I need to see more change is high school to college. So girls are now playing baseball in the high schools. They're trying to get that opportunity to play into college. Um, it's not easy, but I think the more that we can just see girls being able to have that opportunity, whether it's in leagues, but as they get older and not just at the youth level. Right. And as you said, seeing it is when, you know, like it's an opportunity and that you can do it. And I know speaking with you in the past, how, when you became an MLB analyst, like there, there was no other woman doing that before. And you've told me in the past, like just even the faces, the looks on people's faces when you would walk into a booth, like reminding you that, that you are not a man. Like how have you noticed since you maybe first started calling games to now, if anything, things changing and feeling more, more of a, a a welcoming environment, if that is so. Julie, it's shifted so much. I mean, 
it went for, I mean, even five years ago, it's crazy. Like people were just so uh, mixed. I would say it was a strong reaction no matter what. Like people were unbelievably supportive. Like, this is awesome. We love it. Or they're like, I hate you. This is awful. There was never just that middle road. What we're seeing now is that middle road. It's like people just like, are you good? Like you're calling my game. Like, I just want to make sure I, I like to listen to you or you're breaking things down or whatever. Like that's where we need to be. Is just this middle ground of like, I'm going to definitely hear you and not judge you based on your gender. And then I'll decide if I like you depending on what comes out of your mouth versus right. the fact if you're a male or a female. And there's just so many more women doing it. And it's happening. I mean, every month I'm hearing from another woman that's either involved in broadcasting, um, getting up in the booth, going down in the field in uniform. I mean, it, it's unbelievable the growth of women in baseball and honestly, more teams saying we want more women. And honestly, we just want more talent, different mindsets. If we're going to be in a room making a decision and we're going to be doing things, we want to speak to the entire population and not just half. When you say it's like people don't see you so much as uh, with with your gender anymore, like what was what what was was there a moment when you noticed it? Like, was there you know, you said that people sometimes would just you know, people just sometimes hate you in sports because you are a woman. It's just like it it sucks. It's just like, well, you're not like what I I've listened to in the past, especially baseball, because it's such an old dinosaur curmudgeon -y sport for the most part, a lot of like super fans. Was there a moment where you're like, I feel accepted? Um, I mean, I felt accepted when I was hired, like for the people that mattered. I mean, will I get acceptance? Will we get acceptance from everyone? That won't ever happen. That's just, I think the way that the world works for me, I had to learn what is acceptance. You know, if I'm looking at Twitter and I'm looking on social media and I'm looking for, you know, strangers basically to accept me, it's going to be a never ending, you know, feat that I'm never, I'm never going to be able to, to conquer. And I, I had to learn that what matters are the people that hire me, that put me in the position, the people that I care about and love. And I mean, my husband's super honest with me. He'll tell me when I'm like, oh man, that was not a good game. Your energy was bad or whatever. Like, or you stuttered a lot. I could tell you were nervous. Like that's the stuff where I'm like, how can I get better versus be accepted? Um, mm. I just want to be good. Everyone else can decide if that is an acceptable trait or not. <laughs> I can't control it. Um, but what I want to keep pushing is to just get more men and women to think openly about who we're hiring, who not just we're putting in front of the camera, but behind the camera, who are producers, who are camera people, you know, the entire production of just hiring and getting more women involved so that we're just including, especially as we get more female athletes that are successful, is you get including more women in so many different ways. Is there any team you've noticed that has been maybe more... I don't know, welcoming or sort of like empowering women and um, women of color and trying to get more people, women involved than others? I mean, that's why I'm working with the Dodgers. They not only have they hired me, but like just spanning all of their analysts, they're looking for depth and, you know, just difference and different styles. Um, they've also started internships and programs where I've helped them um, get more softball players that are applying for jobs and internships within their entire um, program, whether it's front office. They just hired Monet Davis. Monet Davis is like running video um, at every home. I game. love this. Um, <laughs> it's been incredible, but they've made a point reaching out to me of saying, how do we get more women and find the women that are interested? Because the applications, Julie, are like 90% men or boys, you know? So how do we let women know these opportunities are here? Um, so we started a program where we linked UCLA and Stanford, both their softball programs to where they can now have a pipe pipeline where they're feeding into if they want to get into major league baseball with the Los Angeles Dodgers. I love it. And Stanford, of course, that is your alma mater that you would love to, I'm sure, have more people involved from there. And um, speaking of, I think, no, maybe she didn't go there, but Totally different sport, but I'm thinking of a lot of U.S. women's soccer players played at Stanford. Oh, yeah. And I know that Andy Sullivan wore your name on the back of her jersey yeah. when the all the women were um, 
highlighting women that have inspired them. Andy Sullivan is a midfielder for the U.S. Women's National Team in the World Cup. What was it like seeing her wear your name? They actually have the jersey. It's so cool. I just broke it out because I'm like, um, I haven't been home uh, during the World War. Women's World Cup. So I just got home last night and I just broke out the jersey. I'm like, I need to wear this like every single day. It was awesome. But I think not so much my name, but it was like, you know, the RVGs and like Billie Jean Kings and like just seeing the entire team. And you think about like the fan base of this Women's World Cup team. First of all, it's everybody. But I think about like all these young girls and what we don't do a good job of. And I mean like sports covering in general for women. We don't go, we don't talk history. Like being a part of baseball, mm. that's all they do. We're talking about like, oh, and the 1965 <laughs> World Series, like this happened. And like, shoot, is there anyone on earth that doesn't know Babe Ruth and Mickey Mantle and Joe DiMaggio? Like they talk about these guys regularly. But who are the women that have led the way? And not just within the sport, but just within life. And I feel like they don't get enough attention. So I gave so much credit to the women's national team and honestly the organization that backed this to be able to put women on the back of every jersey so then if this is your favorite player and you love Alex Morgan and that's who she I think she had Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the back of hers um like who is she let me look her up because it's unbelievable how many young girls don't know who led the way to the opportunities that they have now Jess, I know you got to go. Thank you so much for joining us here on Off Air. Now go be on air somewhere else. <laughs> we'll right. see you and I'll send you this Barbie. Oh my God, thank you. I'm serious. I'm going to put it on, <laughs> on these shelves that are here. That is going to go. We got you you deserve it. You deserve it. Really, thank you. All right, now for some other Off Air musings for Bet Rivers. The Canadian women's national team was the first reigning Olympic gold medal soccer team to bow out of the World Cup in the group stage. And I have no time for people criticizing these women. Those that poke fun at them saying, how did this team win a gold medal have no idea what they're talking about. To get it out of the way, the team two years ago was different than the one now. No Janine Becky, no Desiree Scott, and Christine Sinclair was two years younger. It's also a shorter, smaller tournament. Most importantly, though, are the issues that the Canadian women have been dealing with off the pitch, fighting their federation for funding. They secured an interim deal ahead of the World Cup so they can get paid for 2023, but it was mostly so it didn't become a distraction on the pitch. Janine Becky told Roger Bennett of Men in Blazers that fighting with the Federation during the She Believes Cup, which was almost boycotted by the team, was the most draining experience ever. And that while she wasn't at the World Cup, felt it spilled over to the tournament. I mean, these women didn't even have a send off game. Canada soccer showed them just how much they cared about them. They did not play well against Australia. It was embarrassing, but the women shouldn't be embarrassed. Canada soccer, the Federation should be. They had every opportunity to put a stronger team on the world stage, to back up the gold medal they won, and they chose not to. If there's a silver lining to Canada not making it to the round of 16, it's that it puts Canada soccer under the world spotlight to be held accountable for tangible change. Canada has a quick turnaround to try to qualify for the Paris 2024 Olympics with a home and away match against Jamaica. The reggae girls made it through to the round of 16, even though they had to crowdfund through two GoFundMes ahead of the World Cup to help pay for various expenses. I donated $50 to them, and I'm not telling you this to get some kind of award, but to show you that regardless of where you're from or what team you support, we all need to do a better job of supporting women because one, it's the right thing to do, and two, look at the return on your investment. These women have made history and evidently could do so much more with the right resources. Finally, Carly Lloyd, you may have heard of her. Former U.S. Women's National Team World Cup winner, came under fire for her comments on Fox Sports about the U.S. Women's National Team after their draw to Portugal at the World Cup, saying that winning doesn't matter anymore and they shouldn't be dancing or celebrating after their nil-nil draw that got them through to the knockout round. Objectively, the team does need to be better. I've said it before, everyone said it before, the world is better and the Americans need to evolve, which is head coach Vladko Ananovsky's job at this point. But coming for their winning mentality is a tough look in my opinion, because in order to even make it to this point, you need to want to win. That's like one of the pillars of being an athlete, right? 
If you dance and celebrate making it to the knockout round, does it mean you don't have a winning mentality? Carly Lloyd can say whatever she likes. That's why she has a microphone. Just know that people aren't always going to like what you say. And also, the internet never forgets. I know from experience. If anything, I think Carly Lloyd may have helped the U.S. women's national team because, as you remember, Lindsay Horan said after scoring against the Netherlands, you don't want to make me mad because then she scores. Well, maybe making the U.S. women's national team mad was Carly's point all along. This could be a great thing. If not, it's great bulletin board material. Well, that'll do it for this edition of Off Air. Make sure to like, subscribe, comment, whatever you want. I'm Julie Stewart-Banks for Bet Rivers, and we'll see you next time when the mics are off. <laughs>